So what I want to do tonight with you, and I'm happy to take your questions or dodge your brick bats or whatever you have in mind, uh, is to, to give you a sense of where I think from sort of 35,000 feet the healthcare system is in the country. And then to talk in a little bit more detail coming down closer to the ground. Um, it isn't ever easy, and <laughs> the provost knows this at a university, let alone the whole university system, it's never easy to try to change a large and complicated public system in any field. And universities would be example A, and healthcare would be right there with universities. Because these institutions become encrusted with established patterns of behavior, they have strong interest groups, um, they're sometimes frozen by their past, and change is very, very hard. And that is certainly true in something as complicated as a healthcare system. Uh, each part of which, take a hospital, how complicated a hospital is, and then you put a hospital into a regional health authority, and you put that into a provincial health authority, and it's extremely complicated, many interest groups. So change never comes quickly, and there is no magic bullet to make our system better. There are many things that have to be done, some of them incrementally, I might add. Uh, they aren't going to make headlines, but they, uh, over time, have to, have to happen. And I just start by saying that I am now, and I'll explain to you why, more optimistic about our ability to change the healthcare system in a constructive way than I was at the time that I was researching chronic condition, which I really wrote almost from a point of despair because I had been listening over many years to Canadians talk about healthcare and particularly to the political actors and the so-called healthcare experts talk about our healthcare system in a way that I thought was somewhat misleading and unhelpful and prevented us as citizens from having a straight up debate about what we should do about the system. But I think that this is changing and that's what makes me more optimistic and it's changing because those who operate the healthcare system and the political people who are charged with sort of overall policy for the system, are finally facing facts. Uh, rhetoric is being banished. The old rhetoric is now uh, found wanting. And reforms, as a consequence, long discussed, are now, I think, occurring as I move back and forth across the country and I listen to people in the system and I listen to the way in which people are talking about health care. It's a different discourse. I think the, the, the publication of chronic condition in 2012 was not the catalyst. Um, I, I'm far <laughs> too modest to believe that that book changed the discourse. I think what happened is that it came along at the same time as a whole lot of people in the healthcare system agreeing that the way we had talked about the healthcare system and thought about it for a long time needed some substantial change. Even today, Healthcare ministers, I shouldn't say even today, today healthcare ministers who 10 or 15 years ago would have quaked at telling the truth now say simply as a matter of course that we do not have the best healthcare system in the world. And they would have quaked at saying that 10 years ago because they would have been accused of being anti Canadian, of having some kind of a hidden agenda to bring US style healthcare to Canada. Because this is what so many healthcare experts said if you dared to question how great our healthcare system was. And Canadians desperately wanted to believe how great the system was because we'd made it into part of our national identity. It was like the flag. In fact, it was better than the flag. If you look at a lot of public opinion data over the previous 10 years, as I did, pollsters would ask Canadians, what's the most important national symbol? And it wouldn't be Parliament. It wouldn't be bilingualism, the RCMP, the military, the flag, the anthem, not even the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It would be health care. We were the only people in the world that defined ourselves by our health care system. Maybe the Brits to some extent. So when you elevate something to an existential self-definitional question, it becomes much harder to talk about in a rational way. And uh, as a consequence, as I said, health ministers or anybody else who would say, you know, excuse me, we don't have the best health care system, the world gets shouted down. You were anti-Canadian, you had a hidden agenda, 
you didn't appreciate the greatness of the system, you had a different set of values, blah, blah, blah. And I used to go to healthcare conferences and hear this all the time from so-called healthcare experts. And indeed, so, so now we're in 2014, which is 10 years after the Prime Minister of the day and the provincial premiers of the day agreed to spend 41 billion additional dollars on health care indexed at 6% a year. That's what's been going on the last 10 years. 41 billion each year, uh, sorry, over 10 years, indexed at 6%. I wish my salary had been indexed by 6% over the last 10 years. No other government program has had an index of 6%, none, over that period of time. But so important was health care that the political leaders of the day decided that that's what we should do. And they did that because there had been a commission under former Saskatchewan Premier Romano in 2012, 2002 that said the system desperately needs more money. And we need the money in particular to buy change. And he had a number of proposals as to what kind of change he wanted. But the message that the system needed a huge infusion of additional money from him to buy change in the system was accepted by the political leaders of the day. So uh, we've had a decade of experience. And we've spent all that money. And you'd be very hard pressed to find anybody in a responsible position who, said, who says that we got value for all that money. So one of the reasons why people are now prepared to talk more truthfully about the system is that we tried that remedy. We put a heck of a lot of money into this system and it didn't get materially better. So only a fool makes the same mistake twice. So people in the healthcare system are now aware that if they ever did that again, the results probably wouldn't be what they hoped it would be. The second reason is that, again, coincidentally, there was a lot of international evidence that accumulated because of a number of studies that were published in the last four or five years that tried to situate healthcare systems one against the other. And of course, every study uses different methodology. They're asking different questions. They evaluate the information differently, so no one study could ever be defined as definitive. But they all piled up, whether it was the Euro-Canada barometer or whether it was the Commonwealth Fund out of the United States, which is a very highly reputable research fund that studied seven healthcare systems and found ours was sixth out of seven in terms of performance with the U.S. system last. Um, and there were other studies. And of course, the the big one, which I'll refer to later, was the every couple of years, the OECD in Paris, which is the great number crunching organization, publishes health healthcare statistics. And those statistics, like the other volumes, tended to show the following, that we spent in the top five on the amount of money as a society we spent on healthcare, but we didn't get anything like top five results. We got middle of the road results at best. Whereas the other top five spenders, the Germanys, the Denmarks, the Switzerland, the Frances, they all stayed in the top five when it came to results. So we were the only one that was spending high, but getting mediocre or middle, middling results. And, and people began to read these studies and, okay, one isn't definitive, but you put them all together, you probably get a sense of which way the wind is going. So that was the second reason why the mythology that we had the best healthcare system in the world uh, fell apart. And now, quite honestly, if anybody stood up before a group of knowledgeable people in healthcare and started their presentation by saying, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that we have the best healthcare system in the world and here I'm going to hear, tell you why, most people would say, bring in the folks in the white coats and move that person off to where they can be better cared for and let's have a more serious discussion. So this you might laugh at, but this is progress. Believe me, in my world I've been following public debates and participating a little bit in them for a long period of time and if you don't get the starting point for the debate right, you can waste an awful lot of time. And I listen to a lot of political people who don't get the starting points right from a fact point of view. 
They invent things all the time. So this, this is good. This is good, what we're doing now. So what's happened recently? Um, during that period when we were putting the 6% into health care uh, from the federal government, remember that when, the, when that, it seems 10, 10 years ago, it's a whole other world, 2004, the federal government had a big surplus. And all the provinces were in surplus, or very near surplus. So injecting a large amount of money into what the public defined as their number one priority seemed to be not only the right thing to do politically, but doable from a fiscal point of view. And you didn't have to raise taxes. Um, unfortunately, the 2008 recession uh, shattered public finance, as you know, and pushed all the governments into deficit. Uh, the federal government now has a, uh, actually a surplus because the contingency fund in the last budget is greater than the anticipated operating deficit. So de facto, it's now in budget. But it took five years after the recession to get there. And all the provinces are in deficit except Saskatchewan. So the fiscal circumstances have dramatically changed. And as a consequence of the dramatic change in the, uh, in the fiscal situation, the governments have changed very dramatically what they're doing in terms of spending. From 2000 to 2010, okay, 2000 to 2010, every year the average increase in healthcare spending was 7%. That's nationally. Okay? And in Ontario, I like to remind people when Mr. McGinty came into office back in 2003-04, he used to excoriate the bad old Harris Eves Tories for their meanness on the health care front. But actually, the bad old Tories were increasing health care at about 5 to 6 percent. And there was something people forget, I'm not here to defend them, called the fair share health levy. And if you earned over $75,000, you got taxed and the money ostensibly went into health care, although it really went into the Consolidated Revenue Fund. Anyway, McGinty came in and said, we're going to fix this health care system. And in the very first budget, the Minister of Finance for Ontario, the Treasurer, was a man named Greg Sorbara. Nice man. And uh, he announced in 2004 that they were going to put the health care budget up to 7%, up by 7%, which he did. But then he said to the legislature, but Mr. Speaker, that level of increase is unsustainable. That's his word, not mine, unsustainable. For the next seven years, by how much do you think every year the health care budget went up? 7%. Right? Unsustainable it was, but it apparently was sustainable, at least budget after budget. So now what's happened is that the Ontario government uh, has brought the increase starting two years ago down to 2%. Now that doesn't sound like much, but believe me, that's a wrenching change. And nationally, we've gone from 7% down to now in the 25 to 3% range. In the Maritimes, um, the increases are zero, which in real terms is a reduction. In Alberta, Alberta's increase during all those years wasn't 7%, it was 9.5%. Now, their population was growing, okay? People were moving to Alberta, so they had population pressures. They needed more hospital beds, they needed more health care. Still, 9.5%. Now it's down to 3, which is a wrenching change. Quebec was the outlier at 5% when everybody else was down to 2 or zero, or three, but in their last budget, the one before the election that's now on, uh, they brought it down to three and a half. So everywhere there's the sound of breaks going on, if I can put it that way. Because the 7%, uh, as I say, came about when we were in a much better fiscal situation, um, and it was in that era where we thought if we spent a whole lot more money on health care, uh, we'd get better outcomes. Now, if you think I'm just, this is just me editorializing, the um, Health Council of Canada was set up at the time of that 2004 agreement to monitor progress, or lack thereof. The uh, 
Harper government has just canceled the Health Council of Canada, uh, but it did manage to get a couple of last reports out before it died. And in its last report, and I'll just read a couple of sentences from this report, you can read it, it's very, very easy to read and well done. They said this, although the resources to improve our health system and the health of Canadians were made available, the success of the health accords in stimulating health system reform was limited. The decade saw few notable improvements on measures of patient care and health outcomes, and Canada's performance compared to other high-income countries is disappointing. Ten years of investments and reforms have resulted in only modest improvements in health and health care in this country and an unfulfilled promise of transformative change. The outcomes have been modest, overall performance lagging, the status quo isn't working, we need to do the business of health reform differently, etc., etc. I could read other quotations. So that's pretty sobering, and I think that's probably the consensus view of most people. Now, let me be fair about this. When I have written this, and when the Health Council and others have said this, I've received a call, I admire this man very much, from Paul Martin, who signed off on the Accords, okay? And Martin's explanation for this would be that when he signed the deal with the Premiers, it was his intention to meet with them on a yearly basis to monitor progress. And that, as a consequence of the vagaries of politics, he wasn't around. And the Conservatives weren't interested in monitoring progress, so the premiers were able to go and do what they wanted. There was never any centralized focus, and so the results that he'd hoped for didn't happen. That would be his explanation. I, we had lunch a while ago in Winnipeg, and I said, you know, Paul, if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a bus. I don't know what would have happened, okay? <laughs> Maybe you would have every year been able to twist their arms, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? But th I want to be fair. That's Paul's argument. The fact of the matter is that it didn't work. Now one of the questions you want to ask yourself is, if you spend all that money, why didn't it work? How come? Why? That's a lot of money. That's the biggest single public policy bet from a money point of view that my, I've seen in the last 10 or 15 years. Why? What happened? Well, what happened is something I think comes out of public administration textbooks in the first year. Which is, if you put, and this is not the healthcare system. This would be true, and I'm on a university campus, and I've been on two university boards, and I've taught at university, so I know a little bit about how these places work. And it's true in the police force, and it's true in the justice system, it's true in any large public enterprise. And I'm not a public sector basher. If you put a large amount of untethered money into a public institution, the groups that are the most mobilized and motivated will take a disproportionate amount of it. And they will always be able to find a comparable somewhere else that says they're underpaid. Always. Whether it's in this country or in some other country, this jurisdiction or that town or this province, always. So if you look at what happened, a disproportionate amount of the money didn't go to patients. It went to get the people working in the healthcare system more money. So what was happening was we were paying people in the healthcare system more money, a lot more money, to essentially do things exactly as they had before, which is the antithesis of a productivity gain. So in effect, the system got less productive from an economic point of view than it had been before. And lest you think again that I'm making this up, I happen to bring along the Bible, which in healthcare, which those of you who work in healthcare know what I'm talking about, or health policy, which is the uh, Canadian Institute for Health Information, CAIHI, which publishes and collects all the data that we all rely upon. And in their most recent report of last fall, they said what I said, which is that healthcare spending is now down to 2.6% a year. Uh, and uh, they, they went on to say that, uh, they had a number of things, they said that the spending on hospitals was slowing, but 
and here I quote, physician compensation remains the fastest growing category of healthcare spending. Physician spending is expected to reach 31.4 billion, 3.6% growth compared to the overall health budget of 2.6. And um, so physicians' income has gone up quite handsomely over the last uh, 10 years since the money started flowing. Um, and here are the numbers. Um, the public sector physician spending as a total went up from 13 to 14.4. And physician fee increases were the main cost driver during this period, accounting for approximately one half of the annual growth in expenditures. Physician fees have grown faster than wages for other health and social service workers. And uh, increases in physician fees have been above the rate of inflation. And by the way, nurses income went up twice the average annual wage for industrial workers during exactly the same period of time and physicians went up three times faster. So if you had studied or thought about public administration, you could have predicted that if you were going to put a lot of money willy-nilly into a big public enterprise, the groups that were the most mobilized would take it. And they didn't have to change what they were doing in order to get it. They just had to mobilize themselves and put pressure on the governments to give them the money. And the governments wanted to buy peace. So what that money did, instead of buying change, which is what Mr. Romano thought would happen, in fact, we bought peace and we bought time. But we didn't buy change. So why am I a little optimistic? Um, I'll just give you one more stat, by the way, from Kaihai. Um, which is that uh, overall payments to physicians increased by 9% in 2011-12, surpassing the increase of the previous two years of 5 and 8%. Some of this is because we use more physician services, okay? Which is a whole other question about whether we should or not. But some of it is simply because their remuneration went up. Now, by the way, if this was a, a group of representatives of the Ontario Medical Association, I would, having said that, needed police protection or some other, <laughs> you know, security protection. There are probably some physicians in this room and I'm going to hear from them. All I can protect myself with are these numbers, right? This is my shield right here. So you come at me, you better hit these numbers and tell me why Kai Hai's numbers aren't accurate. Um, so uh, what's happening now, and we're at a very, very critical moment. The governments have reduced, as I said, the increase in healthcare spending, but I'm actually optimistic. Why am I optimistic? I think what I see, and I've been in nine provinces uh, over the last 10, 12 months, I see more people in the system and more people who are administering the system and more people at the policy level who are acknowledging the fact that we're not going back to the days of 7% increases. Not going there. We've got now a more restrained level of increase every year, and therefore we do have to change, but change isn't going to be lathered by a big injection of money, so we have to now think about how to actually change the delivery system. And that also to some extent means changing finance. So here in Ontario, I think the government has it absolutely right. The hospital budget is going up at zero, but the community care budget is going up at 4%. There's your 2% average. And one of the requirements that we have to make our system, I think, more quote-unquote sustainable as the years go on is what I call the de-hospitalization of the system. Uh, to get as many patients away from hospitals as we possibly can because hospitals who are wonderful institutions that do great and amazing work, I'm not a critical of them, but we've asked them to do too much. We've had too many people going to their emergency departments. We've had too many people once they're in there stay there too long because there aren't alternative places for them in the healthcare system. We've had too many people who've gone there because they can't get the care that they might need at home that would allow them to stay there. We can't uh, continue to stuff 
uh, as many people into the hospitals, keep them there as long as they've been there, and not have the services outside. And everywhere I go in the country, uh, governments and systems are trying to, do, to, trying to move in this direction. And it's absolutely the right direction to move in, but it takes time. These systems, as I said, are complicated. It takes time to train people. It takes time to set up the new systems, not set them up, but to expand them where necessary. Um, and it takes time to get the governance structure right. I happen to say I'm, I'm opening a tangent here. I don't think Ontario's got the governance structure right because what you want is the most vertically integrated healthcare system that you can get. And the LINs, unfortunately, are halfway houses. They've got some power and they've got some control, but they don't have it all. And the hospitals with their boards, which are still the crown jewels of all the communities and cities that have them, still have a disproportionate control over the budget and the system. Other provinces have regional health authorities, called different things, which are vertically integrated. And they control the entire health care delivery system from hospitals down to community care and to some extent into public health. That, I believe, is the right system. I think it makes for better cooperation among all of the entities. And I think it makes the shift to the community easier than if the hospitals with their boards defending their turf. And that's happening all across the country, and I think it's good. So the fact that the money isn't increasing as it did before is, I believe, driving more creative thinking about health care than when the money was flowing. The second thing that I think is happening is that uh, the organized groups, the unions and the associations, although they wouldn't ever say this publicly, but I've talked to them privately, they know how good they did it. They know how well, they know how well their members have done. Oh, there's a lot of yakking that goes on, blah, blah, blah. And the nurses union at the moment in Ontario is making some noise. But you'll notice all the other health care unions have settled for less than 1%. And across the country, the physicians, no strikes, no threats, no, no, no. Everybody's calmed down in the health care world because they can read the numbers. They know how well they did. So this is a particularly good time. Now the question is, and this is a really important question, the answer to which can't be known, is have we now settled into a pattern whereby our health care is going to go up at 2, 2.5% two a year, which is, from my point of view, quite sustainable, or are we in a kind of 3, 4, 5, 6 year period where we're going to keep it to that, but then there'll be all this pent up demand from people who'll say, hey, I didn't get my, you know, and so we'll be back into surges of four, five, six percent, four or five years down the road, which I think would make things uh, extremely difficult. It's very important that we keep the level of spending where it is because there are some trends out there that are difficult. There are three or four for healthcare, and you should just face them. One is a political decision, and it could be changed. Mr. Harper uh, has decided, or decided a few years back, that he was going to reduce this 6% transfer that had been agreed to and which he had maintained. In two years' time, that's going to drop to nominal GDP, depends on how the economy is doing, let's call it 35 to 4%. Doesn't sound like much. But cumulatively over time, it's a multi-billion multi dollar reduction in transfers to the provinces. And the parliamentary budget officer, in a report that he did to parliament, uh, see, I bring a lot of reports around just to protect myself from critics. In this report, he talked, called the fiscal sustainability report, he signaled this very fact as being the principal reason why Federal finances were going to be in pretty good shape, he thought, but provincial finances were going to be in poor shape. The word again he used was unsustainable because of this adjustment. Now, who knows who'll win the next election, and maybe another party will come along and say, oh, we're going back to the 6% days, which I think would be the absolute worst thing that could be done, but nevertheless, politics being politics, bad things happen, and maybe that'll be an attractive pledge. 
So that's one thing to remember. The second thing to remember is the aging of the population. Now, most healthcare economists when they try to assess what the impact of the aging of the population will be on health care spending, I think correctly say it's not a gray tsunami. You see this written all the time. It's not a gray tsunami. It's going to increase by one, maybe one and a half percent, the amount of money that we need for health care uh, from the public. And since at the moment we spend $210 billion on health care, 70% of which is public, 30% of which is um, private. You're talking about, what, 150-ish billion dollars public. 1% of that's another 1.5 billion. That's doable. We're not going to break the, bank, break the bank on that. So there's no gray tsunami, especially if we reorganize the healthcare system better to take care of the relatively small number of patients with chronic conditions multiple chronic conditions often who tend to be elderly. If we can deal with them at a lower cost point with nurse practitioners and community care so they don't spend large amounts of time in hospital, I mean, that's what I mean by changing the system. So that's not the problem. The challenge is on the other side and it's something that goes beyond health care. At the moment, 14% of the Canadian population is over 65. And that 14% takes 44% of all healthcare spending. But you all know that the number of people 65 and over as a share of the total population is going up remorselessly and will for about the next 25 years. So by 2030, it's estimated we're going to have 26, 27% of the population um, over 65. And what's really got the actuary scratching their head and where they admit that they were wrong, this particularly cuts in on the pension side, is they underestimated in the last five, six years the spike up in the longevity of life for people who are over 85. So the mortality or morbidity tables that actuaries used to use, they're all scrambling to revise because you're getting more people who are living 85, 90 and beyond. And those people tend to spend, cost the system 25000 plus a year, uh, and that's way more than others. So it's partly a cost driver, but the other is if you have fewer people who are working in the workforce, earning money that can be taxed by the government, you have a revenue challenge, and you have an economic growth challenge. And just the other day in a speech in Halifax, some of you may have seen this reported, by the governor of the Bank of Canada, Mr. Polarts, from this university, I might add, he warned about this. He said, look, we're probably entering into a period of slower growth than what we knew before the 2008 recession just because of the demographic mix that we have. And that will have an impact not just on health care, although it'll have an impact on health care, but it'll have a, an impact in other areas as well. And uh, in this report that I was referring to from the Parliamentary Budget Office, um, this is Kevin Page, now at the University of Ottawa, um, they go on at some length about this very phenomenon. So when you're talking about aging and healthcare and finance, it's not just the spending, because I say that's not a great tsunami, it's the impact of revenues that governments have. And since healthcare is the most costly spending item in any provincial government's books, that's going to be a rather significant challenge. And then there's the ongoing cost of technology. Technology in healthcare can sometimes save you money and it can sometimes cost you money. And if there's a new device or a new technology that comes onto the quote unquote healthcare market, it's very tough for a Minister of Finance to say, I don't think the cost benefit of that, or I should say a Minister of Health, I don't think the cost benefit of that is very good. Or if there's a new high priced pharmaceutical, cancer drug or whatever, that's only going to make life a little bit better for a short period of time for a small number of people, and your medical advisory committee says, you know, Minister, that's really not very cost effective. I know in my business, 
the last piece of the food chain is you go to the media and the minister is already heart, accused of being heartless and cruel and cutting off cancer patients from life-saving medicines, etc., and the opposition throws questions at you. There's a great phrase in British healthcare that says, anytime there's a bedpan that falls anywhere in a hospital in Britain, it reverberates in the halls of Westminster. <laughs> and there's something to that if you're the health minister. So that's another reason why, uh, so we've got, we've got the decline in transfers coming up, which is reversible if we want. We've got the demographics that I just described, which are gonna have a slower growth trajectory than what we had experienced before, which will have an effect on government revenues. Um, we've got um, these other sort of economic forecasts that suggest growth isn't gonna be as strong, so we're gonna to have to adjust our system to a, a lower level of growth. So how's our system doing? Well, here is the latest OECD uh, data bank, 2013. Um, I invite those of you who are interested or those of you who are students of health policy to read this, pull it down and read it. It's kind of the international comparative standard. I can summarize it for you, perhaps unfairly, because there's a lot of data in there of saying that we are still in the top five when it comes to total spending. The share of our GDP on healthcare has gone down from 11.6 to 11.2 percent, partly because of this spending curve I was talking about flattening out. Uh, so we're at 11.2. The Americans are up at the top now at 17 percent. Um, so we're in the top five among the public healthcare uh, largely public health care countries, but our results uh, remain, shall we say, mixed. Let's put it that way. And um, we see particularly that our costs for medical personnel are almost at the top, top three. And the irony there, it's worth a tangent, is you say to yourself, if you look at this OEC da data, we have fewer, for, fewer physicians, sorry, fewer physicians per capita than the OECD average. Interesting. But our physician costs are way, way, total physician costs are way above the OECD average. So that's an interesting question for some graduate students here to write papers about. Why is that? Why is it that we have fewer doctors per capita than the OECD average, but our physician costs are way higher? One obvious answer is we pay our physicians way better. In Sweden, if you made $120,000 as a doctor, you're at the top of their salary level. Here, if you were paid $120,000, that'd be half of what a family physician gets. But the other reason is that we use doctors for things that in other countries they, put, they give to midwives or nurse practitioners. Or they put doctors on salaries instead of a fee for service or some blended system. So there's a variety of reasons why our physician costs are as high as they are. And the one I just mentioned a while ago, which is how well doctors did in the last six, seven, eight years, is only one contributing factor to this curious anomaly. Um, pharmaceuticals, I haven't said anything about. But the big three in healthcare costs are, of course, hospitals, doctors, and pharmaceuticals. And we have, according to the OECD, again, the U.S. is always the outlier. So, I, so many years I used to hear people comparing us to the U.S. system, and we had a great system, and they had a terrible system, and the anthem would play, and the flag would fly, and moral hearts would beat in Canada, and, you know, we're better than the Americans. It was just a bogeyman to get people not to focus on our problems, to use them as the uh, bogeyman. So just get them right off the table. They have their own system, which is now changing. But they have very high drug costs. Um, we have the second highest. So when you're asking, how come our system's so expensive, we talked a little about hospitalization. We talked about physician and nurse costs, but pharmaceuticals are the second highest. And I don't actually think, and I've said this to the brand name pharmaceutical people, so I don't say things behind their back that I won't say to their face, that we're not getting a commensurate amount of research out of that industry consistent with the high cost that we pay. Now, we're also big drug users in this country. 
The reason why we have high pharmaceutical costs is partly because the costs of pharmaceuticals are high relative to other countries, and it's partly that we're big druggies. We use them a lot. Now, sometimes drugs can actually save money. Rather than being in the hospital, you can be treated with pharmaceuticals for a lot less money. Think, of, think back, my mother had a, an ulcer condition, which in an earlier stage in her life she had to have operated on. But later she was able to take pharmaceuticals, which dealt with the problem, at a much lower cost for the system. So sometimes drugs will save you money. But the costs are high. There are many reasons for it. I won't take you through it. You want to ask a question, I'll give you a longer answer. But one reason, <clears throat> you got to love our country. So we've got 10 provinces. They run the healthcare system. And so, and they guard their, their jurisdiction very carefully. Okay, so we're in charge of the healthcare. We're in charge of drugs. Okay? So they each have their own formulary. And um, they're all going to send a person out or a team out to negotiate for the drug cost for the formulary, which they need for hospitals and for their welfare cases, etc. This is crazy to have 10 negotiators for a country of 35 million people. Australia, where I've been many times and was just a few weeks ago, have 24 million people. Their six states run the healthcare system, but they have one negotiator for the drug needs for all six states. So they're negotiating on behalf of 24 million people. Oh, no, no, but we're Canadians. We have the best healthcare system in the world. <laughs> so what we do is we have 900,000 people in Nova Scotia. So somebody from Nova Scotia goes out and negotiates to, for the formulary. The differences among these formularies are small. Now, I know progress is being made. I know that the provinces have finally agreed that for a handful of generic drugs, they are going to allocate a negotiator. That's good. And as new brand name drugs come onto the market, approved, they're going to negotiate collectively. That's good. But that's like baby steps. Okay, so it's just so logical. Anybody who took a first year economics course knows if you're negotiating on behalf of 36 million people, <clears throat> you're going to get a better price than if you negotiate on behalf of 900,000 or 3.5 million in Alberta. And <clears throat> I don't know how many interprovincial premiers meetings there have been, Council of the Federation they're now called, in which they've talked about this and made these baby steps. But if we had bulk buying, we would have, in my judgment, uh, lower costs. And uh, that would be very helpful in trying to restrain the cost of increases in the healthcare system. So I, I've rattled on and bored you, I'm sure, with lots of statistics. I should have brought along you know, a PowerPoint, but this is a literate audience, so I didn't think I needed to do that. <laughs> I just end by saying I am actually more optimistic than I was because people are talking about this issue in a much more sensible way. I, I brought this along just, just to illustrate that I'm not the only person who's saying this. You may have seen in the Toronto Star several days ago uh, that, um, that uh, Murray Martin, who just stepped down as the head of Hamilton Health Sciences, so just up the road, said, um, with the economic reality in Ontario, there are a lot of really tough decisions that are going to have to be made. I think there are opportunities for very significant further consolidations. Um, there are still obviously huge changes that need to come if our healthcare system is going to survive, he said, and so on. So here's a man who ran one of the big uh, healthcare systems in the province, and he's essentially saying uh, what I'm saying. But I'm more optimistic now that people like Mr. Martin are saying things. Uh, he has no agenda, he has no ax to grind. And more and more people are saying that, and that will help us focus on the task at hand. And places like Health Sciences here and what Ann Snowden and her group do over at Ivy uh, are constructive contributors to trying to adjust our system to the needs of tomorrow. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. <laughs>